welcome at Vodafone Firestarters. It's a platform for innovation. I would like to introduce a very special guest today, Ken Siegel. And uh, Ken Siegel uh, wrote a book last year called Insanely Simple. And he had the privilege to work over a decade with Steve Jobs. He was the man uh, who actually invented iMac. And he was also the creative director of the very famous <laughs> Think Different campaign. I also have want to introduce my sidekick, Nalden. And everybody knows Nalden in Holland. He's a blogger, but he's also known as the co-founder of WeTransfer. Give them a warm welcome, please. <laughs> Ken, you're the famous man on the planet who invented the I and iMac. How does that feel? Well, yeah, it's important to uh, make the distinction. I didn't exactly invent the iMac. There's a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, the I, you know, it's kind of a somewhat embarrassing thing in that I wrote a lot of longer pieces in my life, you know, uh, for advertising, like 12, 12 page, 16 page advertising pieces. And then all anybody really remembers is a single character, I. But it's something to hold on to. So it's, uh, it's a cool thing. No one knew, to be honest, it was going to turn into anything nearly that big, obviously. Steve Jobs didn't know it. It was just the name of a computer at the time. We knew it had a sort of a foundational poten potential to the other products. But um, no one was even thinking of iPods and iPhones and things like that. So uh, it was rather surprising and kind of cool that it turned into what it did. Right. Um, but you also was part of the Think Different campaign. True. And uh, let's bring up the video to put that... Uh, great commercial into perspective. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. One question about this ad. In yes. 140 characters, what's so special about this ad? Um, I think it captures the spirit of the company from the day it was founded and the spirit that remains today. That's right. And you well, were mentioning... What I was going to add was that that's not the version that aired. If uh, you Apple fans might know that that was the voice of Steve Jobs, uh, which didn't air. And that uh, was something we recorded because we wanted him to do the voiceover. We thought that only he would have that kind of uh, belief in the words. He thought they were so important, but he resisted. And uh, we ended up using Richard Dreyfus because, uh, again, Steve didn't want people to be debating whether he should be the voice or not. He wanted them to hear the words. <laughs> so is, is Steve Jobs, like, I'm really curious, of course, um, is, is he the craziest guy you ever met? <laughs> uh, in that sense? In a, in a good way? Yeah, I think so. I mean, few people have the opportunity to work with someone like Steve and just to watch the way he did business meeting after meeting um, and to sort of navigate the waters because you never knew when he was going to explode. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just a, it was a challenge and it was fulfilling and all the things that a lot of normal advertising jobs are not. I was wondering, uh, another question about Apple, because we don't want to talk solely about Apple. I'm also very interested about your philosophy about uh, simplicity, but we'll uh, get to there later. Um, how would you sell the old one out of Apple's product lineup, Apple TV? I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that question. What about Apple TV? How would you sell how, that? The new one? The new one. The new one that is, in theory, coming? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't really know that, do we? Um, I would say, I mean, if it, if it goes as you would like it to go, it would do for television what the iPod and iTunes did for music um, and really turn the industry on its head a bit. Um, I think 
one of the things that musicians did not like a whole lot was the fact that you could buy songs uh, individually as opposed to part of an album. Um, it's really sort of a empowering the consumer kind of thing where it's like, you know, I don't want those 10 songs, I want those two. And the artists may not like that, but for consumers, it's a very good thing. And I think, I mean, I don't know about you guys, how it works here with cable, but um, I pay a lot every month, you know, a good $100 or so to get, you know, 90 stations I don't ever watch. So mm -hmm. if someone said I could have HBO and you know, a, a network or two, whatever, those are the things I want to watch, I would be a happier man. I'd probably be paying a fraction. So I think the idea would be um, if more people could get and pay for exactly what they want, you'll actually make more money, you know, the, the content providers, than trying to gouge them and make them buy things they don't want. And from a uh, creative perspective, advertising perspective, um, what will be your angle in, in selling, selling that innovative product? Well, uh, it won't be my job, for starters. <laughs> I'll be one of the audience. Um, Some ideas. Yeah, but it, it's it's one of those great opportunities. That's the great thing about working with a company like Apple. Every time there was a, a, a new product, a new revolution, uh, it was your job as an advertising person to put it in words and pictures and get people excited about it. So I'm not exactly sure how they'll do that, but I hope it's uh, something simple, wonderful, yeah, and simple. All right, let's move to the first uh, statement. We have three statements coming up. And um, the first one is uh, this one, is, this strikes me. Uh, this is the Twitter account of Apple. And um, Twitter has, uh, or Apple has actually 14,000 followers on Twitter. Twitter. And uh, below this um, <laughs> screen capture, it stated Apple hasn't tweeted yet, but you obviously <laughs> can see there. Is Apple, uh. is Apple actually an anti-social company? Very good question. People have debated that. Apple doesn't normally go out and do things itself because it knows that it has uh, just this entire world of buzz around it and every product creates more and more buzz than the last one. So when there's a, a month or two leading up to a product, like I don't think Apple, II, Apple TV, if it's coming, is imminent. It might be like mid next year. But you'll see in the month or two before that it gets talked about everywhere. So Apple may have zero tweets. Obviously, they're not going to comment on, on a product that isn't out yet. Um, but the world will be buzzing, and they get uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars or euros of uh, free publicity. Uh, it's just the way it's always been. But you think, is that sustainable, this strategy, not tweeting, being closed in a, in a way or in, a, in mm. a world we live in of openness and transparency? I think Apple may have to change a bit moving forward, but they don't seem to need to do that now. I, I think they have reaped the benefit of being secretive and having the buzz uh, because they're secretive. The unfortunate thing is that there's a negative side to that that they've never experienced before, and I think they're starting to experience it, which is uh, the recent nosedive in the value of their stock and the perception out there that Samsung is starting to you know, gain, if not uh, exceed what Apple is doing and there's suddenly a lot of negative stuff out there and, and Apple doesn't participate so it all just kind of piles up against them so I think they've they've reaped the benefit for all these years of the positive vibes and they've never really thought about what might happen when it turns against them all right we're going to talk about mm -hmm. the future um, in a bit um, I was wondering besides Apple what is actually your number one experience you had which made you uh, embrace simplicity Wow. <clears throat> I told you not to ask embarrassing questions. Well, I had a, a couple of experiences, a lot of experiences after Apple that caused me to embrace simplicity only because they were complicated. Okay. You can um, share one of those. Yeah. Well, and those are things I cover in my book, uh, Intel and Dell in particular, not mm -hmm. to knock the companies necessarily, but the way they're organized and the way they make things so complicated. So that's really what struck me about... Um, you know, there's an Apple way to work and there's a other way to work. Um, it, so it, it really affirmed my belief that Apple's way and simplifying things, streamlining, is actually a far more efficient way to work. And can you share a story at Intel? You mentioned that in your book, the differences yeah. between the creative process, for example. Yeah. I mean, they would do things um, testing. You know, it's a it's a popular thing in the advertising marketing world to rail against the idea of focus groups. Well, um, 
I try to draw this this parallel between Apple and Intel. Uh, starting from the day you you present the work, you would put it on the table at Apple, and with Steve Jobs, you'd have some good debate. Maybe be sent back to do it again. You never know. But you'd you'd sit around and you'd pick what you want to do, and then just go do it. Um, at Intel, that meeting that same meeting occurred, but they would never. Uh, get it down to less than two picks and then they'd say now let's start this whole process and the process took like three extra months and it cost a lot of money hundreds of thousands of dollars um, just to create focus groups all around the world different countries and have all this input in there and then have a round of revisions and do this and that and it's all done really because they want to make sure they get it absolutely right but yet when you look at the final product versus Apple's final product, when they do it faster and cheaper, it doesn't even compare. Apple's is you know, many, many times better and more effective. As a person, as a creative person, don't you feel like because of all of these complex uh, processes, don't you want to make a simple product yourself? Uh, like project management, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, um, I don't have those ambitions, actually. <laughs> uh, it's it just... It's fun to be an observer of it all. Um, I observed it my whole advertising life and never really did anything about it. I always thought like it would be a good book to write, and then I finally got around to doing that. But you, you, you obviously uh, can create a good benchmark of simplicity, mm. or is that your way of, of, of uh, that you wrote the book, that that is the benchmark for simplicity, or you, you don't have the ambition to create something yourself that is also in a different way a benchmark of, look, this is my way of simplicity. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it never really struck me. But um, Okay, I, you, men you mentioned the six principles of simplicity or the ten principles yes. of simplicity, excuse me, in your book. Yep. And um, could you apply um, an example of how you applied those principles at Intel or B&W, other clients you work for? Well, I think... That was the problem in those situations is that you're dealing with the culture of a company and it's not easily changed. You, you need uh, someone at the top to support the effort. Mm. Within Intel or Dell in particular, um, there were a lot of people there who agreed with the agency and we'd sit down amongst ourselves and say, this is the way it should be. And we had a big speech given to us by the head of marketing at Dell and everyone rallies behind and wants to do it, but then once everybody goes off to do their thing, it starts crumbling, you know, and that's yeah. because there are these processes in place and processes are set up to ensure success. Um, hopefully that success could be repeated, but I think over time in a complicated organization, people start blindly following the processes without, uh, you know, without loving the idea that's going through the process. And I think the difference was at Apple, um, there was Steve in the room all the time, and he wouldn't allow that to happen. I, I have to protect this idea because it's great, and don't let anybody tell you that we're going to change this because some guy in the Netherlands wants it to be this way. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but it's funny, Michael Dell is actually one of your biggest fans of your book, I heard. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say biggest fan, but he, but he, liked he did express, uh, and I was surprised because um, exactly. I, didn't do, I wasn't all that nice to him in the book. But uh, he liked it, and his marketing people uh, have responded well to it. And um, I'm going to be getting, be getting together with those guys soon. It should, should be fun. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, move to the second statement, and uh, let's show the video. statement is momentum fuels motivation and um, the video features Kelly Slater who is uh, 11 times uh, world champion mm -hmm. and actually surfing is the art of momentum 
and without momentum you will suffer a wipeout. So does this also apply for companies? Momentum, will the, is it actually fueling motivation? Yeah, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. And one of the great things about Apple compared to other companies is that they have this momentum and they, they established it many, many years ago. So a lot of companies, again, we'd get these speeches internally that we're going to change things. But um, unless they can stick with it uh, and invest in it, time, energy, money, um, it quickly goes away because people start compromising and complexities creep in. Mm. Um, if they do it for 10 years, then it becomes part of the culture and uh, – people don't really remark upon it anymore because it's just the way things are. So Apple has a, a, a culture which is the way things are, but it started very, very long time ago, and, and they were very, very true to their values. And these uh, a lot of complicated organizations, it's very, very difficult to just turn it around like that because they don't have that momentum. I think Apple's momentum is innovate, and they know that if they don't innovate for a period of time, people will start abandoning them and that's one of the criticisms now and we'll get into the future later but um, people are wondering are they innovating as well okay you give me a feeling actually that of course Apple is a great company but to apply and embrace the, the 10 principles of simplicity is really hard is, is it is it possible for a company like Dell or even uh, smaller companies to embrace those uh, principles it's very difficult because you do need someone who believes in it. I think Michael Dell uh, believes in internal competition, so he's set up Dell, so it's actually got separate business units that have their own profit and loss concerns. They don't, one doesn't really care what the other one is doing. I mean, they can say they do, but what they really care about is making their money, whereas at Apple, everything is all for one, and it's all about the Apple brand. Um, so it, it is difficult. I think... I used to say that it was easier for Steve because he started in his garage and he just held on to his values. R rather than having to turn something around, he was really just being himself and refusing to change as they got bigger. Mm -hmm. However, um, the more I thought about it, there's an interesting point to be made there, which is that he was gone for 11 years from Apple and it got to be complicated and big and unwieldy. And he came back after 11 years and did have to turn around a company that was complicated. So they they had a very complicated structure uh, organizationally and too many products and all that stuff that he had to deal with. So I think it can be done. Um, Steve was a, a unique person and he had the power to do it because Apple was sort of his child. But there's no reason why a Michael Dell um, couldn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change things. And when it comes from the top and everybody has to do it or leave, that's when uh, change happens. Okay. Talking about um, future, and mm -hmm. of course we're here at the at the digital conference. How will technology and digital shape the future of marketing? Well, I do think there's this uh, this thing about technology becoming so much part of our lives, and we start identifying with brands. And I think it's one of the reasons why people get so nasty with each other, whether you and Android versus Apple, and how dare you? I just got this really long email from a family member, you know sort of ridiculing me for being an Apple fan because he's discovered the way with Android. And it always, it always struck me that, you know, if I'm driving a Honda and some guy pulls up next to me in a Mercedes, we don't exchange glares like, how dare you drive an expensive car? <laughs> it's like, that's his choice and all the more power to him. And for some reason, technology, I, I, I don't know why it is, but, but because it's part of our lives and we carry it in our pockets or whatever, we get all hung up about having to be smarter than the other guy and like, you know, how dare you use that technology and, you know, I can't be your friend anymore and that kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, people have this attachment to technology and mm -hmm. I think that um, when it comes to marketing, um, it's about really becoming more part of someone's life in that way. Um, and that's the challenge, that's what's so different in, you know, in the old days when I started in advertising and I'm afraid to tell you what year that was, but it was just about a magazine ad and a TV commercial. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you want to involve people. And, and the, the best things out there are the things that get people wanting to click and share with friends and, and make it part of their life. So that's the challenge ahead. Uh, how do you think about iAds, which was practically a failed product? About which? Apple iAds. Oh. Exactly, um, you don't remember. Yeah, no, really. <laughs> I mean, that's a bad thing. Really? I mean, no, I, I was not 
actually a big fan of iads but actually um, was it too complex I mean, yeah and there was some of that element of control too uh, that apple gets criticized for and, and it came to a head there too where you know you can't run something unless apple says it's okay and i think you know people like to have some kind of freedom um so i think apple's getting much better as a as an advertising platform and and they're they're doing uh, better. So I think that's got to be part of their future too, obviously. I think it will be integrated in Apple TV, maybe? Possibly. Huh. You never know. Yeah, there's a there's a point in my book where I actually talked about um, the secret meeting you know, at Apple that where they considered putting advertising in the Mac in OS, OS. OS. Yeah. <laughs> um, which I was shocked to see. And OS thankfully 10 they didn't. or 9? OS 10? Or? No, it was, it was nine. like 9, I think. Oh, yeah. hmm. Um but Apple has sort of toyed with these ideas, but at the same time, that's sort of contrary to the Apple way of purity and cleanliness, and they've got to juggle that. Um, so I, I personally have a thing. I sometimes consider myself an anti-advertising advertising person because nothing makes me matter than things that interrupt me. You know, I think that it's up to advertisers to find ways to become part of your life that aren't annoying. You know, there's a an obligation, a moral obligation for ad advertisers not to pollute the environment. Um, and like when I look, you know, my favorite example is just uh, YouTube. You know, it drives me crazy when the little <laughs> ads come up exactly. and I have to X the thing away and then I have to start the thing over if Three I want to see seconds. it clear and clean. Yeah. And I just think that kind of thing is, is really a, intrusive and, and annoying and it doesn't really help sell your message. That, that makes me move to the final statement about intrusiveness and uh, environmental pollution. Let's uh, show this uh, this video. Times Square. That's where you. Um, well, not yeah. you. Li you don't live in Times Square, but you live in the New York City area. Um, <laughs> advertising is that. Really. <laughs> um, first of all, just side note, nothing to do with that, but it reminds me of an old, one of the first iMac commercials we did was, I thought, fantastic and doesn't really get remembered very much, but it had no words at all. It started out with like uh, behind a PC with all the wires and mm -hmm. ugliness and the beige box mm -hmm. and it would, and, and you heard those sounds, just horns and crowds and ugly sounds. And then the camera moved over to the iMac with just the two little cords, the phone cord, because it had a modem, <laughs> phone and, and power, and this beautiful shape. And then suddenly you hear the sounds of, of a creek flowing water and birds chirping. <laughs> so it was just going from ugly, polluted, to this serene way of computing. So it reminded me of that. And the statement, um, what do you think? Well, I think... In the traditional sense, it is, mm. because people don't want to just be bombarded with ads. I think there's this creeping menace, you know, where everywhere you go, there's another ad staring you in the face. And I think, you know, marketing people should be artists in, in a sense that you've got to find really interesting ways to get into someone's life that doesn't annoy them and mm. gives them something they want to be part of and, and actually share with their friends. Um, and that's the challenge. I think they're always going to be, well, it's like anything. Uh, you know, there's some people believe in quality and some people believe in making a fast buck. Um, and people who run ads like that and just plaster them everywhere will always mm. be probably the majority. But hopefully there will always be people in classy companies who want to really interact with people and become loved. And I think that's what Apple was always good at. What do you think? Yeah, it's hard to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm uh, I'm wondering about uh, the audience, but we'll get to there later. I have, to f okay. I have a final question uh, for yes. you. Um, you mentioned um, the stock price of Apple, and uh, it plummeted last Friday with uh, 12 percent due to uh, weak sales forecasts. Of course, um, the biggest concern of Apple fans is that Steve is not around anymore right. to save the company. Um, is there actually a, a future for Apple? Very good question. I still have a lot of stock, so it's important to me personally. <laughs> um, and, but I haven't sold it yet, which is a good indicator of what I really believe. Um, I think Apple has always been under 
such scrutiny, and there are so many people, there are legions of bloggers and analysts and commenters who who want it to fail because mm-hmm. they got big and successful, and there, there are all these people trying to out, sort of outdo each other, like they're going to fail for this reason and that reason, and I'm going to be the first person to point out why they're going to fail. But if you look at all the numbers, they're all very, very positive, and that sometimes all these things conspire to create a negative image, and with they set records this quarter with with the money they made, but it, the increase wasn't as much. Mm-hmm. And then they give this conservative guidance, which they always do anyway. And then they usually outdo the guidance, but that on top of the other thing, you know. So people start writing all these stories. And I mean, I think there's some substance to it. I'm not being, uh, you know, a fanboy. Um, I do think they're a great company, and they've got great values. And I have I I have confidence that they will go forward and do great things. But the world changes, and and it's only when they revolutionize a category that they own it. Um, and it's been a couple of years now. So tablets, I mean, you could you could make the argument that I sometimes do. It's rather flimsy, but I cling to it. Um, and that is that Apple created this stuff, and I I like to reward the company that had the idea. You know, mm-hmm. if Apple didn't create the iPhone or the iPad, then obviously Samsung wouldn't be selling these products. So I give Apple credit for that and I like to support them because they're the innovator but as far as a customer going into the store to buy something today it's like there's a galaxy versus an iPad um, you know you don't really care who invented what this one's cheaper and it does a lot of cool stuff and they buy it so Apple always needs to stay a few steps ahead but that's of the that. problem because Steve is not around anymore to be the visionary True. leader to drive Good that point. innovation. <laughs> yeah. Tim um, Cook Well, I think they've replaced Steve with several people. You know, mm-hmm. you've got Johnny Ive on the creative side and Tim on the operational side, and together they form a, a, a Steve Jobs, uh, kind of. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> There'll never be another Steve. Uh, but I think, like, is, I always like to say it's like a... Is, is having two people at, at such a high level, isn't that complex? Uh, <laughs> very good. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Um, it is, no, you and you like to have it in one, And I, but I think Steve was that special, and I don't think they're going to find it in one anymore. So the question is, can they do it with a team versus a single person? Exactly. Um, but I was about to say that I, I think when you're a parent, you teach your kid your values, mm-hmm. and you send them off into the world, and you can't be by their side all the time, and you just kind of hope you've given them the best push you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the way I see Apple. I think Steve really tried hard to instill his values and they have a thing called Apple University where they train their executives to carry on uh, you know Steve's vision and they're doing all they can but Apple will encounter circumstances Steve never dreamed of and and you can't ever really say what Steve would have done you can only take your values and act accordingly so okay let's move to the audience uh, if you look at culture wise US culture European culture Asia culture, Asian culture. Mm-hmm. If you look at simplicity, how would you rank the three? Uh, uh, you're saying simplicity being very important. Is there a cultural thing about it as well? Yeah, and when I was um, touring Japan, I got a lot of questions about Japanese companies and how they can become simpler. Um, and, and there is a, a cultural thing, uh, and I'm not sure how translatable it is uh, because you've got to deal with the culture Uh, you know, of a country and the companies they're in. Um, I, I think simplicity is just a thing that has universal appeal and those who, who understand that and leverage that will do better. Uh, I think people like to work in a simpler environment and um, people prefer products that are simpler. As you'll, you know, as I talk about it, Um, simplicity isn't just a thing that's like in the products. It's in Apple's culture, and it's, it's the way Steve Jobs looked at, at everything. He just had this sensibility about him where he didn't like things that were complicated, and he applied that in many, many different places. Um, I think, again, culturally, it, it, there are different cultures. They're very different in this world, obviously, but the love of simplicity is something that I think every human being appreciates. Aren't we talking about simplexity and keeping things simple? Because simplicity doesn't really exist. It's it's very complex to keep things simple, but simplicity right. it sounds so simple, but it's not. Well, and, and, uh, yeah, and that's like one example. Like uh, yeah. I think Google does a very good job in uh, googling, uh, which is a very simple 
action, but the complexity behind it in right. the algorithm is crazy. And that's, that's very true. And I try to um, make sure nobody misunderstands me that it's like, oh, just be simple and everything yeah. will be great. It, it is incredibly hard to be simple because it does take this ability to, to stick with it and, um, and push for what's right and, and defend against those who would, who would change it. Uh, so it, it, the thing about simplicity is that it looks so simple, but it rarely is. And that's why uh, so few companies are able to achieve it, either within their own culture or the products they create. Is simplicity for dictators? For dictators. Yeah. Uh, another good question that some people ask if, um, you know, what about a consensus-driven company versus uh, a, a leader-driven company? And, and this is a tough one because you could say that Dictators have a way of getting things done, that's exactly. for sure. And, it's and I think Steve certainly had that going for him, where he wanted something done, he wouldn't take no for an answer, and if you couldn't do it, he'd find somebody who could. So it'll get done with or without you, and, and he, he accomplished things that way. Um, but the question is, do people enjoy working in that environment? Do they, would they prefer working in an environment where they, they're all teams and they get to participate, et cetera, et cetera? And I, my answer to that is really that you know there there are different ways to accomplish it, and different companies do have different cultures. And simplicity isn't for everyone. And um, it works well with Apple, but is it translatable across all industries? You know, to a degree, maybe. Um, it, it's really a kind of a situational thing. I think it takes really smart leaders to um, figure out where and how they apply it. <laughs> All right, I would like to uh, round things up. Thank you very much, Ken Siegel, for uh, being with My us pleasure. here today. And Nalden, um, this session will be online soon on Twitter, on Facebook, at firestarters firestartersnl, I should say. Please check it out. And uh, thank you again for joining this show. Thank you. <laughs>